and um, and now we're going to move into our final presentation for the evening. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Wayne Robson um, to talk about uh, his work with Screen Scene, um, working as uh, were you were you three um, D lead or three D sup? I was three D supervisor on that. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. You're normally a character artist, though, aren't you, Wayne? I've done all sorts, to be honest. You know, after <laughs> 25 years plus, it's easy to say what I haven't done. Um, but yeah, I've done all sorts. I've been lead late notice, I've worked in games, I've all sorts. So I'm, I'm going to jump in quickly here. So I'm very excited to see Wayne here. He, he, the last time he came down to London, must have, we reckon, Wayne, it was about 10 years ago. So It's going to be around 2010, I'm betting. Yeah, so good to have you back. And we were also, as the, the 3DS London Committee, we were also slightly nervous about inviting Wayne on here. <laughs> not because not because he's not because he's a wild cannon, but um well, that as well. Xavier and the guys, your presentation was so good and it was so well thought out. Um and then Wayne is definitely gonna cover the more uh, violent side of uh, Mars exploration. So well, it was yes. slightly nervous that that it would uh, that it would jar, but um, I think it's going to work out really well. And, I think uh, I think Wayne's presentation is going to be a little bit less about science fact, hopefully. I think it's going to be more well, about yeah. blood splatter. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, that and yes, yeah, so you'd be surprised how much science there was behind it. All right. Yeah. Do you want to share the reel with uh, the sound off that side or this side? Uh, yeah, Nigel, please, please. I can do that. Yeah, Hang on. Yeah, just make sure you mute the sound, otherwise yeah, you two are pig fit. So there's no, there's no sound on the, um, on the clip. Um, we had to censor Wayne's music selection. So Wayne, if you want to start talking while the, while the thing's going, then that's great. Cool. Yes. Right. I'll try and look at this little square here in Zoom. Um, everything, so you can do. Yeah, it's, it's like the, the, the Mark War Zombie. You know, it's still, it looks right. You know what I mean? There's other designs you could do which should have more reflectivity and specularity but that wouldn't actually be right, right for what was needed in the film i think the, the, bottom, raw, you know. the raw kind of energy and it kind of works well mm. the, you know the make it make it work kind of attitude yeah, kind of yeah and it was it was captured making sure you captured the performance of the actors you know as well which is important even though it's just screaming i'm not an actor you know so you've got to make sure that comes through um, but this is the infamous shot 1016 because you can see it starts from quite far away, gets very close to the cab. Everything is digital apart from the inside of the cab on that. In fact, any shots like this, you know, everything apart from the inside of the cab, that's all digital. That rover there. The lighting, that was the first shot I did. I just put a big block on one side, a huge, you know, box in, in Max, made it the same colour as the ground and off we went. The dust storm, which took seven lifetimes to get the look right you know this has got one of the shots with the digital doubles and as you see they never really get beyond mid distance so you didn't need to put you know it didn't need to be too detailed there was nothing to be gained from that Wayne how long ago was this uh started this in 2012 and finished as I say just after St Patrick's Day in 2013. So would it make a difference today with 4k and 8k all of that stuff? Oh it would now yeah there's so many things. If I had to go back and if, if I had the same team now to redo this film and do exactly the same shots, I would do it a whole different way, and I would get it done in a, like a quarter of the time. I really would. For four times the cost, though. Yeah. Well, <laughs> not exactly. Not exactly. Some of it was just a matter of uh, clever thinking. You know, like the, there was the fact that if they hadn't realised that putting loads of 8K maps on a bolt. You know, when you had thousands of parts, was sending V-Ray through the roof, that if we used levels of detail to speed the render up, you know, this could have been a lot more expensive. You know, it punches above its weight for the budget that it had. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I, I do think Very the night nice. shots especially stand up really well. You know, it, it, a lot of the night shots are done, as I say, by Jack and Moore. Uh, this is another one where that's everything part of the cab is all digital. You know, and... It's, it's one of those things that I, I do have really good memories of. And the pit, so many versions of that pit. You know, I tried to save copies of, the, of all of it when I finished, but there was like literally about 100 terabytes of different versions of the pit. Each stone had, you know, had to be sculpted and everything else. And me and Glenn got to the point where we could rattle this off. But that shot there, that, that's one of the ones that sells that as a real thing with the torch. And that was just 
you know, Yanko Slavov, who's one of the best trackers in the world, you know, tracking the heck out of that torch. So it was perfectly exact. And that shot they I did in, like, just after my dinner on 10 minutes. That's the reflective the air shot. Everything like that. The only thing it would look like is reflective air. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to break the rules to make it work, you know. That was a lot of the stuff is extension, like the door. Um, and you can see a lot of the stuff like the visors look especially well indoors. And there you go. There's the final shot with the little badge in the corner there with the name of the team on it. Now I will share my screen and we will try and work this all out. First of all, let's just start with the rover and I will share that there. Right. Can everybody see the rover? I hope so. <laughs> right. Um, so this is the model itself. Now I would not have been able to do this back in 2012 or 2013. We were using Max 2009. And if you want to get that rover using this null from there to over here, you were looking at half an hour because you're looking at over 5 million polys. There are thousands of parts on here, even in, right inside the cab as well. Uh, this was all modeled and textured by Daniel Rath. Uh, they need, he'd started before I had on this. Uh, we had some amazing controls. Uh, it happened to be scripted. And John O'Connell, who's now working at ILM, by the way, who's my number two, uh, has created a wonderful system. Uh, now, this is the basic version because it ran off scripts. So I can, you know, you can move the wheels, you can take the, uh, the main bit there and fiddle with the cab and all that. Everything moves, everything responds to everything else in a mechanical way. And some of the detail on it, just in poly mode, because half the text is after eight years of well, bye-byes in the video. Um, is quite amazing what you managed to do, Daniel Rath, in a short length of time. And especially when you've got the likes of Glenn Southern on the team, who everybody knows is a fantastic poly model of going way back. If your poly work is not good, Glenn's going to say something. And Daniel, at the time, was very early on in his career, and he really pulled it out of the hat. Uh, one problem we did have, uh, which was a design issue, which we couldn't solve, and that is the wheels here, um, they went and had it properly designed, then went and had it, got a hold of it. And they came to the conclusion on Mars, this was the best sort of tread. Unfortunately, as you'll notice on that shot 1016, when motion blur is active and these wheels are rotating, right, <laughs> you can't see what speed it's going because the tracks are too small. It's it was one of those things we couldn't solve. We tried everything. And that's one of the reasons why shot 1016 took as long as it did. Uh, everything on this, right way down to tiny little bolts in holes like that, right, has an 8K map. Uh, this was not my idea. However, it also made a pain in the backside to render. We were going through deadline and early on we had some amazing uh, bugs like one day we submitted five shots just as tests because we couldn't, they weren't final. We didn't have the logos approved yet. And it turned out Barbie pink. Everything was Barbie pink and we didn't know why. And we tracked it down. It was down to a lot of, you know, there was that many layered 8K maps on top of each other. Uh, we need to optimize it. Now, what I did is I took one look at this and I realized there was three classifications of shot. There was the ones that were fairly close up, like 1016. There were the ones that were very far away, like 1011. And you did not need, in any universe, 8K maps on a bolt when the entire rover was maybe 25 pixels tall. So I said, well, okay, why don't we just use a level of detail on the texture, which people in the team hadn't really came across too much because they were visual effects artists, not games artists. So I asked John O'Connell to write a script. And what it would do is, if the rover was that sort of distance, it would then load a 1K map set. If it was that sort of distance, it would load a 2K map set. And then, you know, based on camera distance to one of these nodes, I think it was that one. Um, so it automatically did that, uh, depending on what shot, how far away it was, and things like that. Now, lighting this, 
this is where we sort of broke all the rules because normally when you're writing stuff like this, there's lots of reflectors and multiple lights and blah, 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 blah. All the outdoor shots are lit using a single light and bounce light. That's all it is. Uh, while there were HDRs for a lot of the scenes, there was some that had none. So I'll tell you what my logic was. This is Mars. Although it looks quite nice, it looks rather the same. It was filmed, by the way, in Wadi Rum and Jordan, where they filmed some of the latest Star Wars movies and The Martian and stuff. It's basically red dust, right? With blue sky. So what we would do is nick one of the HDRs from one of the other shots. I would send it down to Compton and say, all right, take the sun out of that shot. They take the sun out. We would then put it in the shot, roughly align it, stick the sun in, make sure it was lit correctly for the shot. Boom, sorted. And we had quite a fast turnover. To be honest, if you know, I'd been able to move the rover as fast as I can now, you know, in Max nowadays, the entire sort of film would have been done in about three weeks. We were juggling six machines at a time each at one point. So um, I will change you over to a different scene file. I'm sure, I'm, let's just see if I can stop sharing that for a second. Well, I load another one while I'm doing this one, because uh, it's da, 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 that one, right. So uh, don't, uh, don't want to save all the top of that. That's the original one. And we'll share the next one, which should be da, 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 this one, the zombie. <laughs> now, at some point, these eyes are going to turn blue because funny story, just after Christmas, my really good graphics card exploded in a shout of sparks. So I'm stuck with a really old rubbishy one and it can't handle all the textures. Uh, this is a, an 8K texture on here of the zombie head that was done in my free time. Uh, in fact, before this happens, I'm just going to get rid of uh, that because if I don't, the wall without the blue eyes, it looks quite scary. So this went through a lot of research. There was concept art that was provided. Uh, and Roy Robinson, the director, being a 3D artist, he took this idea of a zombie very seriously. What would a zombie look like on Mars? Most of the decay that you see uh, that modern zombies are based on is what I would call wet decomposition because we have a lot of liquid in the soil and things like this. So it decomposes in a different way. On Mars, it would not only be dry, but incredibly cold. This made it a pain to find reference for. Uh, but we did find some, and the reference folder that I had was like a horror show at one point. I had to get a special dispensation and a hole for the firewall. It was uh, quite funny in a way. Now, this is obviously separate parts. So if I just hide, you know, that there, and we go back to the face, which has now went blue. And I'll just up arrow so we'll see the textures. And then I will turn this off. And these are all the textures here. That's this there let's just see if i can get it to convince it to uh, show me things it's lovely right take the bump map off and there's about in the whole thing about six and a half million polys it wasn't really going mad uh the low res is extremely low res in fact what i used was the level one because if i go down to zero it disappears in mud box we never did work out why um, so if I go into flat shading mode and put the wireframe on, it's not that high, but bear in mind what this guy is doing a lot of the time is screaming at people and going un -un -un with his mouth and looking angry. You didn't need a lot of control. There was no point overthinking it. So for this, there was, and let me just consult my notes here. I'll tell you exactly how there was only 19 blend shapes on the entire character. Now, the bone rig was very, very simple. And most of the stuff that you see was stuff in the eyes. In fact, I'll try and, if it be behaves itself, I'll show you the sort of thing I would do, is when I was doing the blend shapes, I would make a, like a layer at this level. Um, I would then go along and find my freeze brush and bring it up like this, just, you know, just isolate off an area like that. Then go along, get the grab brush, Make sure it's not too angry because normally I set it around 50. And then you could, you know, bring it down, make sure the folds are right, and obviously take a little bit more time than I'm doing here. 
But so once you've got that, unfreeze it. And if I stick it back onto smooth shade mode, obviously I can then fade this in and out. So that was what a lot of the blend shapes were. It wasn't based on the FACS system. It was sort of a hybrid, sort of a zombie hybrid of the fax system for facial animation. Uh, so that was basically the zombie. The texture was all hand textured. Uh, and it was a case of what happens to human skin when it gets very dry and cold, uh, which gave me some tremendous nightmares, some of those reference images, you know. But there's quite a lot of detail in it. That was a mask that we use for certain blend shapes so that it would show transparency. It's really like a marble type effect, what happens, and it would go green. Uh, and it would have to be based, obviously, on the original actor's face, because we already had a, a digital double of him, as it happened. So I used that as a basis, rip the face off the model, and use that as the basis to sculpt everything else, and work out how the muscle would dry, where it would pull in, you know, places like this where it would affect the bone as well, because it would be that cold that it could cause problems on that level if you were a human being. Right, now if I go to my other one, I'm just gonna open another one of these because I've got a, uh, a system here where I can, right, save that one. This one should be loaded now, and off we go. So, uh, it's been quite a while since I've had to do stuff like this, you know. Right, that should be it. Has it loaded the correct one? Or is it still loading? Oh, there we go. Yes, this is getting there. Right, I can share it now. Right. I'll go to flat colour. Just hide a few of the lights and stuff like that because it's uh, very distracting. And then we don't need the cameras. This was the final version, which was in a turntable. So obviously we've got a lot of helpers here. So there's two helpers that are parent to this over here, which we worked out was the optimum distance for moving the eyes. So the eyes would rotate and not look cross-eyed. If you get too close to it, uh, things can, you know, look a bit odd. And it looks like somebody's looking at the nose. There's basically two bones in this, like one going down there and one going down the neck. Uh, there's a small one for the jaw in here, if I can actually find it. It's been eight years since I looked at this, so that's quite a long time. With my amazing naming system. If I go to the main head here, and we'll show you, this is the, the morph targets there, so. The best one was the one that uh, took the longest to do which was this one which does this for the mouth. Normally that would animate the teeth as well and pull them back. And that, if you're trying to do that in, in any sculpting application and get it to slide laterally without going in or out, it's really not easy. Uh, that took, you know, an entire night of many attempts to get that one movement correct on that. Um, the zombie itself it held up well enough in the film. Uh, the first shot in the reel is the very first version I saw of it uh, because that stuff was all rendered out by Rory himself and he composited it in After Effects, whereas the rest of the film is in Nuke. And he's he had a very old school way of lighting. So with him, there was a million lights in different color codes like red, green and blue. And then he would change the lighting in comp. Not like light passes, a bit more old school than that. So that's how all that stuff was uh, done. Now, if I stop sharing again, well, we go back and share the other one like this. Right, the Liev Schreiber digital double. This was done in a single working day. What we work from, I don't know how many of you have ever seen the old, you know the old scans used to do with uh, Microsoft Connects? Right, and they always look really ropey and rubbish. That's what the scans we got were because the technology was still quite new. So I opened these scans up and I'm like, well, we can't use that. That's, we can't use it. It's, it's gonna need redone. So 
what we use the scans for was in the case of your know, show's face here was just for the main forms like if i look straight from the front there you know you can see that one side of his face is vastly bigger than another this cheekbone is lower down than that one the center of his jaw here you see there's a different angle on either side so it stopped me having to look at all that stuff and spend a couple of days doing it now obviously all this was uh was all textured there was some epic cheating went on because we had some high-res photographs but they were all full of shadows and stuff like that so the the likes of the head is a combination of photo projection with some quite you know epic paint overs and you can spot the paint overs if you look at the little tiny red dots here and there which acts you know people see it moving and they assume it's part of the human skin even though it's not it just helps as a bit of an illusion uh the rest of it yeah that's basically photo projection there was some areas where there had to be some paint overs the back was never seen you can see some of the shadowing problems we were having on this and some of the stuff like the straps never got finished off because they were never ever seen in a million years and if something wasn't seen then you know it didn't get done simple as that we didn't have the time but film was done on a tiny tiny budget so there was three main doubles there was the Marco, the Romana, this one, and obviously there was the Irwin one, which is the guy who goes through the airlock, right? Which we, you know, did as well. But after a while, the thing is, Leo Schreiber, right, was the best known actor in the film. He had to be spot on. The rest of them, we could swap bodies for the two other male characters very easily. So the best, the rest of it was just sculpting heads, you know. Two different heads, a different suit for a, for a male, a different female suit. Changed the names over, and that was it. Um, my one of my favourite memories uh, of this. I'll stop sharing because I, it's pointless sharing for this part. Right. Um, every now and again, there's a shot that you're working on. On paper, seems really easy. You think, oh, that's an hour tops. This shot I'm on about was one of those shots. So of course it had been allocated. Well, well, we'll give them half a day just in case. And I'm like, look, it's not going to take that. I'll do it while I'm doing something else. And it was, in one of the shots, uh, the female Romana character, they had taken the visor off because I'm guessing, and it's only guesswork, that it was reflecting the camera crew, right? And it was far too expensive to, you know, take them all out and comp. So the idea was simple, replace the visor. So if you're thinking like I am, you're thinking, okay, Make the visor, boom, boom, boom. We already had a CAD file, so that's that sorted. It's going to be either a plastic, acrylic, or a glass. Put some fingerprints, some smudges over the top. Boom, done. It's a one second shot. So that's what I did. And it didn't work. It looked terrible. It looked wrong, even though it was physically correct. So we all stood around looking at this, trying to work out why this physically correct surface, in fact, we got to the point of even getting in touch with the people who made the props, what did you use for the visors? Still didn't work. We couldn't work it out. And it was last thing on a Friday, and I had a rule that nobody stayed late on a Friday because we'd all go out and relax in the local bar for an hour or two. And it suddenly struck me to have one of these crazy ideas. And... What you see in the film for the visor replacements is actually an impossible material that can't exist in reality. It's reflective air. I basically thought, okay, well, let's just take the refraction out of the equation and just make it reflective. So the visors are all reflective air. You know, and the, the film had lots of little things like that, you know, that we hid in it. Um, but I think it's, this film was also a massive amount of, it was down to the comp department. Uh, there was a lot of work put, as I say, by John O'Connell, by, you know, Garloff, Lagerbeck, you know, lots and lots of people. Uh, it wasn't just me doing stuff, you know, it was finding the best inner person, how to get the best out of them. Um, and so, as a tribute to this team, which, to be honest, to this day, it's still the best team I have ever run in my life. In the last shot we ever had to do, is the it was the airlock shot and it was me and john o'connell everybody else had went home and i said john 
you reckon we'll get wrong if I change something on this model? He says, well, I've only been known us about. So I took the patch, this one that you see on here, on the model, you know, you can't see it now because obviously it's but the one on the breastplate, the red one. And I replaced it. So the, in the center of it, it had a world, and above it had this little circular design. I replaced that with a 3D Max teapot. And the names around the side, I replaced with everybody on the crew. So it's, it's not really visible in the shot at all, unless you really freeze frame and had a huge telly. But uh, all the lads knew it was there. And it, it helped make the work, you know. But it was, it's been fun looking back on this, you know, eight, nearly eight years later. Because there's so many things I'd forgotten about working on this one film. And it was such a magical time because we did impossible things on the world's tiniest budget. You know, time was talking to the director in a kebab shop at four in the morning, you know, about what we needed to do on the Monday. Things like that, like crazy things, it, but it worked. And it was interesting because the stuff that was done with the Rover in Wadi Rum, I know that they used as a basis on when they were doing the Martian. It was looked at when they were doing the Star Wars stuff because we got it right. And we only needed one light. Sometimes you don't need to overthink it. So that's basically me done there. I think I've talked for long enough, haven't I? Uh, God, yes, Wayne, thank you. Yes, Wayne, brilliant. Thank, thank you. Thank you for talking English through some of it through uh, as well. Brilliant. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful brilliant. presentation, Wayne. I really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, the, the work's incredible. I love... I love the free-flowing form that you have of just creating this beautiful stuff. And obviously your creature work is incredible and the digital doubles. I mean, I wouldn't even know where to begin with this stuff. Well, obviously, normally it's just panic. You've got, you've got something to do and you've got to make sure it's done, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, Wayne, are you allowed to tell us what you're working on at the moment? Uh, yeah, because I'm working on nothing. <laughs> oh, okay. Literally, I have no work in at all at the moment. Nothing at all. It's been quite scary since COVID kicked in um because all it's true, yeah well it's like being freelance and being based only from home a lot of places that i normally have dealings with have either shut down or are really on iron rations and they're only doing stuff internally so there's very little overflow there's very little that pushes the envelope because normally a lot of the time when people come to me it's because they have a problem yeah. you know and they can't solve now at the moment they're playing safe so it's i honestly don't know how it's going to pan out you know, over the next year. It's well, I well I don't either. But I mean, as someone with your your skill and and background, hopefully, you know, we can make it through. But yeah, tricky times for everybody, definitely. Mm. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't want to don't want to end on a bummer there, Wayne. Well, sorry, yeah, so I, I, feel like they, <laughs> sorry it, I mentioned it. I think the the one bright thing about the whole COVID thing, you know, sometimes you work on a project and you think this is never going to see the light of day. Yeah. And I worked on this um, very low budget TV show on the back end of 2019. Uh, they filmed it in an, IKEA, an abandoned IKEA warehouse. And it was called um, Flora's Lava. In fact, I'm wearing the top from it at the moment. And I'd made this, and it was all these different rooms and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I can't see how this is going to work as a show. You know, but I'm like, you know, nice enough people to pay on time. It's really enjoyable work, you know. Next thing I know, and this was uh, towards September last year. It turned out not only had it been broadcast, but it was the top show in, was it June or July on Netflix? It was the most popular show on the whole of Netflix around the world. And I was completely oblivious because I won't watch TV. Wayne, it looks like there's a job offer for you already in the YouTube comments. So uh, go through those. Uh, uh, someone's got something for you. It, it's Mars again. So, um, okay. And it, it, does anyone. On the uh, panel, have any questions for Wayne there, please? Well, I don't Sorry, know. Um, Wayne, how long did it take you to fin uh, complete the whole film? Right, I came in September. A lot of that was, it wasn't, well, it wasn't it's what I call post viz, not previous, because a lot of it was just making sure the assets were right. The first shot wasn't started, I think it was towards the end of October by March. The last two weeks with me and John O'Connell, we had 86 shots between us to do over the last two weeks. And we were done just literally about two days after St. Patrick's Day in March in 2013. And it was absolute full on straight at the wall. You know, everybody's working on multiple machines. It's the only way to do it. 
the comp department hated us because we were whizzing our chairs around the wooden floor on the floor above them. So it sounded like a train going past all the time. But yeah, it, it wasn't a long, it wasn't that long really. It really wasn't. Well, most of the in fact the first two months was waiting for approval on the logos. Because the legal department apparently over in the States were dragging the feet because every logo has to be approved to make sure it's not a real firm, which is a good idea, obviously. Unfortunately, we were sitting twiddling our thumbs, not able to do anything or start any shots because nothing had been approved. You know, so yeah, didn't take that long. But I think a lot of it is how you manage the team of people and it's no good going around throwing orders out. It's getting the best out of them. And that's how you get things done. Not shouting at them, but find out what is their motivation, why are they doing it, and what makes them tick. I like to think we didn't manage that on that one. Amazing. Brilliant. Thank you. No, that's great. So, does anyone have any more questions for, for Wayne? It's um No, think... just uh, just a big thank you, Wayne. Brilliant. Um I knew was gonna I knew you were gonna kill it. It was great. <laughs> Why everyone else was worrying. Well, you were going to swear and stuff. They didn't need to worry. Oh, well, I did make a very conscious effort not to swear. Yeah. I swear a lot less now because my daughter's living with me. She's only 12. So I'm trying to make sure she doesn't grow up like, talking like. Well, we're on YouTube anyway. now. We have to make it child friendly. Exactly, yes. I think. Uh, Which is good because we're all children anyway, so it works out well. Um, uh, Josh, that's it, I reckon, isn't it? That is, uh, Wayne is our last presenter, yeah. So um, we can wrap up if no one's got any other questions. Thank you all very uh, much. We can wrap up. I would just like to um, 